Hello everyone. We'll be continuing our discussion on neurological examination of patient with altered mental status. In this lecture, we'll talk about relevant neurological examination for an altered mental status patient. The role of neuro exam in altered mental status is to figure out if the mental status change is resulting from any structural brain lesion and if so, what is the possible location of the lesion. As you talked about, small lesion in thalamus, midbrain, pons or medulla can result in altered mental status while you need bilateral cortical dysfunction to be altered. So when you are examining the patient, try to think where the lesion might be. A lot of us rely heavily on the CT scan of the brain to figure out our answers. CT scan is decent at finding brain bleeds, brain shift, brain edema and hydrocephalus. However, it is not good at figuring out acute strokes early in presentation. It can miss small embolic strokes and is certainly not good at evaluating posterior fossa lesion. A good neurological exam findings can push you towards ordering more appropriate tests rather than CT scan. Renal nerves examination are important because they evaluate integrity of different part of midbrain, pons and medulla and therefore it's a very good idea to know where the cranial nerves exit from because the place where they exit from usually have their nuclei located in that area. So for example, light reflex looks at cranial nerve number 2 and 3 which can assess midbrain and upper pons. Corneal reflex looks at cranial nerve number 7 and 5 so it evaluates pons pretty well. Dolci and caloric test look at pons and midbrain. Gag reflex and corneal reflex looks at medulla. Pupillary exam is the most important aspect of evaluating altered mental status as it can give you a lot of idea about the location of the lesion. You have to understand some basic anatomy of this area. The parasynthetic supply which constricts the pupils comes through cranial nerve number 3, that's oculomotor nerve. The sympathetic supply descends from pons to medulla and reaches brachial plexus and then it is carried around the carotid arteries and then it reaches the eyes and causes dilation. Cranial nerve number 3 is in close approximation with the uncus part of the brain. Therefore, in uncle herniation, this nerve gets compromised and what you will have is loss of parasympathetic supply to your pupils and loss of motor function as well. So you will get ipsilateral large fixed pupil looking downwards and outwards. Lesions of tactile area will result in large and fixed pupil and the lesions of diencephalon will result in small and fixed pupils. Large and reactive pupils can be seen if there is lack of parasympathetic supply or excessive sympathetic supply. So patients with anticholinergics, sympathomimetics, hallucinogens and serotonin syndrome will have large and reactive pupils. Midbrain lesions will have mid position and fixed pupils. Pontine lesions will have pinpoint pupil. Pinpoint pupil can also be seen in opiate toxicity. Other reason for pinpoint pupil is use of cholinergic eye drops or cholinergic toxicity, organophosphate poisoning, clonidine toxicity, and severe hypercapnia. Any disruption to the sympathetic supply to the eye will result in unilateral small pupils with associated tosses. This is Horner syndrome and you can see it in brachial plexus nerve injury, damage to the nerve plexus around carotid arteries during central line placement, carotid dissection and medullary infarcts. Anisocoria refers to unequal pupil size and this can happen if there is an impaired sympathetic or parasympathetic response. Physiological anisocoria is the most common cause of unequal pupil sizes affecting up to 20% of the population though the difference in pupil size is less than 1 mm. Once you have ruled out mechanical and pharmacological etiologies such as surgery, trauma, inflammation and medication, the reason for unequal pupil is usually Horner syndrome that is decrease in sympathetic supply or third nerve palsy which decreases parasympathetic supply. 
Let's try to understand pupillary gaze and nystagmus. In a normal condition, either side of vestibular system is pushing your eye towards the other side. This keeps your eyes in equilibrium. However, if you have hypoactive lesion on one side, for example, in this case, right side, your pupils will be drifted towards the same side. This is also called slow phase of nystagmus. In a normal brain function, your brain will try to correct it and that would be a fast phase of nystagmus. In patients with altered mental status or coma, your fast component is missing, so your eyes will drift towards the side which is relatively more hypoactive. So bottom line is that your eyes are trying to look towards your hypoactive side. As you talked about, your eyes will deviate towards the side with more hypoactive lesion. Therefore, patient who has left frontal lobe lesion, your eyes will look towards the same side. If you've got a hyperactive lesion, for example, tort palsy after a seizure, this is a hyperactive lesion, so your eyes will look towards right, which is relatively more hypoactive. Lesions in putamen would have similar finding. Pontine lesions will have gaze to the opposite side of the lesion because of the crossover. Bilateral thalamic lesion will result in your eyes looking down towards nose. However, this can be seen in metabolic encephalopathies as well. Midbrain and upper pontine lesion will have skew deviation where eyes are looking towards different sides. This can also be seen in third or fourth cranial nerve injury and lesions of medial longitudinal fasciculus. Rowing eye movements are slow drifting movements and these suggest an intact brain stem. These are mostly seen in metabolic and toxic encephalopathies. Ocular bobbing is rapid conjugate downward movement of the eyes. This is sometimes seen in pontine stroke. If the movement is more rapid, this is vertical myoclonus and this is commonly seen in pontine strokes. Ping pong gaze is horizontal conjugate deviation of the eyes and this is commonly seen in metabolic encephalopathies and toxic ingestions. If the movements are much faster, this is horizontal myoclonus and this is sometimes seen in serotonin syndrome. Hippus is the spasmodic or rhythmic contraction of pupil of the eye and this occurs due to dysregulation of central parasympathetic nervous system activity. This is mostly benign. However, exaggerated hippus can be a sign of non-convulsive status epilepticus. Pupillary light reflex looks at the integrity of cranial nerve number 2 and 3, which looks at midbrain and upper pons. Lesions above thalamus and below pons usually preserve pupillary reactions. Doll's eye or oculocephalic reflex look at the integrity of pons and upper brainstem. The role of oculocephalic reflex is to stabilize your retinal image. So if you have movement towards neck clockwise, your eyes will move counterclockwise. This is positive doll's eye and this would tell you that the midbrain and pons are intact. Negative doll's eye does not result in any eye movements. Always make sure that the cervical spine has been cleared and there is no injury before performing this test. Putting cold water in the ear canal results in hypoactivity of the vestibular system on the same side. So this would result in your gaze looking towards the cold side. This is your slow phase. In normal response, you will have correction, which is the fast phase of the nystagmus. And as you already know, nystagmus is named after the fast component. And that's where the acronym COWS come from. That means if you put cold water in the ear, the nystagmus will be towards the other side. If you put warm water in the air, the nystagmus will be towards the same side. However, you need higher brain function for the correction. And in patient with altered mental status and coma, this may be absent. So only part you will see is the slow deviation towards the right side. In brainstem injury, there'll be no movements of the eyes. Sometimes you will see only one eyeball moving. And this would still mean that your brain stem is intact, but there's possibly problem in the medial longitudinal fasciculus on the left side in this case. 
Corneal reflex looks at the integrity of your pons. Your input is from trisemilar nerve and your output is from the facial nerve. Understand that the medial aspect of cornea is more sensitive than the lateral aspects. So if you don't get a response from the lateral side, you can certainly attempt stimulating the medial side of cornea. Gag reflex looks at the integrity of your medulla. The input is from the ninth nerve and the output is from the tenth nerve. In an intubated patient, you can put a suction catheter to stimulate oropharynx. That should elicit a gag reflex. Cough reflex looks at the integrity of medulla and lower structures. Here, the input is from the vagus nerve and the output is via phrenic nerve and abdominal muscles. In summary, to evaluate a comatose patient, perform a general physical examination, pay attention to the blood pressure, temperature and respiration, examine skin and look for signs of trauma, observe for movement and posture, perform a neurological exam and go in order, perform a GCS first, look at the eyes, make sure that you look at the pupillary size, gaze, movements and light reflex, then go ahead and examine other cranial nerves, Perform a doll sigh and corneal, gag and cough reflex. Next, look at the muscle tone and reflexes and perform a Babinski. Examine for meningeal signs and finally perform a fundoscopy. Thank you.